I see a lot of familiar faces. How many people were here in 2007? One, two. Okay. <laughs> All right, so look at that. That was probably everybody then. I think there were 12 people. Uh, <laughs> it was a nice church. It was great, right, in the church? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was very exciting, and uh, it thrilled me a lot to talk about closure to that group, and uh, and again to talk to Lispers. How many people are Lispers here? Okay, good. I'm presuming um, everybody knows Lisp here, and if you don't, you just got to struggle a lot, although there's nothing here particularly <laughs> that Lispy. But um, it's a great heritage, and uh, certainly closure and Datomic um, follow through with that. So what I'd like to do tonight um, is talk about Datomic from the perspective of um, it being a functional database. It's a lot of other things as well, but that's an interesting way to think about it, especially for programmers and list programmers. It's an interesting way to think about it. Um, I do know and see that there are some people here who've seen this talk, or at least a lot of the slides from this talk before. So I'm hoping to go through it quickly enough that A, I can get some hands-on time, and B, we can get some questions so that everybody at the different levels can catch up and have something um, useful. So, what is Datomic? It's a new database. It's actually not that new anymore. I have to change the slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's almost three years out now. It'll be three years in the spring. Uh, and and then I think the value propositions or, or whatever the key points here are that it, it's uh, it's trying to be a database about information management as opposed to a place to stick your stuff. So information versus place. Um, it's trying to give the programmer the database as a value just like any other value they're used to manipulating, like collections or strings or numbers. You have a database, and you can treat that um, and program with functions against that uh, the way you do any other values. So it's very much about what you bring all the way to the application programmer. Uh, and the third point is also in that same category. Um, databases traditionally have had a bunch of cool declarative programming um, things, like core engines and SQL and things like that, and no matter what you think of SQL, it's still great to have that you know, sort of set algebra, which again is something we usually think of as being over there. It's in, the, it's in some remote thing, and it's a different language, I send it strings, and it's not really for some, something I'm going to have in my own program. Uh, but I, I think that's sort of a shame, because there's a lot of power to declarative programming, and we don't get to use it that much. And the ultimate objective of all this stuff is to make uh, programming less complex. So we're going to talk about that value proposition, a little bit about the information model, architecture, and then and not too much about architecture tonight. And then I'll do a little hands-on and hopefully QA. So we'll simplify the value proposition. It's a functional database. All these things would fall out of that. Um, right? If it's really functional, it's not going to be about places. Um, maybe the declarative doesn't fall out of that. <coughs> so why do we do functional programming? Right? It's to stop us from accidentally doing I.O. No. <laughs> no, I mean that's no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to um, put good words to this, but I, I do have this idea that um, your programs are have two essential natures. One part of your program is going to be about moving stuff around and be sort of machine-like in that way. And the rest of your program should be logic driven. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the languages we've had, especially you know, languages like Java, um, were actually designed to do the machinery part. And, because, and that's all you've got. You should apply it to everything. And it's really a terrible fit for, um, for, for doing logic. Uh, so we talk about high level languages, we, you know, essentially, you're a high-level language to the extent you're not talking about, you know, computer do this, computer do that, right? Um, and, and I think we have this problem, especially because you know, computers used to be small and we used to have to, like, do a lot of work to get anything happening on them, not much memory, not much power. Um, our program and the machine were intimate, you know, when we programmed in C, you know, we didn't really think that our program was something different from the machine, it was just a, a way to instruct the machine. But we wanted to get away from that. And object-oriented programming, you know, objects are like little machines. And we use functional programming to break out of that, to get something that's more like mathematics, right? It's pure functions are timeless. They don't have any notion of state, right? And it helps you understand what your program's about. That's why we do it. 
Uh, and then hopefully your program is more likely to do what you want. <coughs> so, uh, when you adopt functional programming, the problem you have is uh, generally programs are not just running in memory one time to produce one answer. They run over time. And they run on different boxes, many boxes. Right? And what's in the middle of all that, usually? This big global variable called the database. And it ruins everything. <laughs> uh, so, how do we... Uh, how do we get away from that? And the first thing is really to, to say um, that, that I think the database has to be represented as a value to a program. Uh, and that means that, uh, of course, there, there is something that's changing over time, right? People are interacting with it and they're putting novelty in somewhere, right? So there is some place, there is some machine-like thing out there. Um, but we need to reduce the amount of time we're interacting with the machine and get back in our own hands uh, something we can use to do logic with. So what we want to end up with, and what, what, it, what I mean to have a database as a value means that you can write uh, functions to take database values as arguments. Because you can pass a database to a function. And similarly, you can write a function that returns a database value as its result. And at that point, uh, if you have pure functions and, and you can use databases as arguments and return values like this, you can do functional programming with the database. And then you have to have all the regular database stuff. Right? You want a database to be durable. At least in the case of Datomic, we think it's important for it to be consistent. Um, a database really is a database to the extent it gives you leverage. Right? If you put a bunch of stuff in a bag, you know, is that a database? Well, I mean, it's a place where all your stuff is. Right, but if you have to go, you know, to find everything anytime, it's like, well, it's like Hadoop, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not leverage, right? If you have to examine everything to do anything, then you don't have leverage. And so traditionally, you know, we had file systems before we had databases, uh, but we didn't call them databases until we had more. And that more is usually <coughs> takes the form of indexes, right? Something that gives you leverage, lets you get to a particular thing without examining everything, lets you slice and dice the set, a subset of your data so that you, uh, you have more power over it. Even a file system does have indexes. It has, has some them. of that, but we still didn't really call them databases because it wasn't arbitrary. It was sort of like a special purpose. Um, and of course, you need to share this across processes. And this is sort of the thing, right? So how do we get, I mean, functional <laughs> programming is sort of um, isolated, right? All functional languages, they're about the program. And most systems are not a program, they're n programs. And uh, so how do we get functional programming benefits everywhere else? So I'm going to contend that, uh, oops, that a functional database must be the, the value itself, right? If you're going to have the notion of a value, right? Obviously, um, you know, we know where everybody, let's say we know everybody's email address in this room, right? And then somebody changes their email address, right? There's some novelty. Uh, if, if we're going to have a notion of values and we're going to have new stuff, Right? then how do we keep the idea of a value? And, and I think the way you do is to, if you're fully accretive, that means that you only add, and you add like with tree rings, then I think you can retain the notion of a value because if at a certain ring of a tree, and inside that, that never changes. If you add new rings, that's not a problem. And there's a way you can think about a database as being a big value that extends over time, and as time passes, you get to see more of the value. And there's probably some <coughs> nasty physics philosophy something behind that. Because <laughs> otherwise, what are you going to do, right? There's not really an effective way to do uh, a, a functional database with snapshots. It's far too expensive to do it. Um, but however you choose to do it, and, and Datomic chooses to be uh, accretive, um, you have to have immutability. Right? Otherwise, you can't, you're not doing values. So I've been saying database, and I think we need to pull apart two different notions of a database. Uh, we have this notion, a database system, and this is really all we ever had for database. It's all we ever talked about, right? The database was, you know, it's running over there, and you talk to it, and you send it messages, and it sends you answers. That's a database. And now I think you need to split that apart. There is going to be that thing, and its job is to coordinate, right? People have novelty. They need to send that novelty to someone who's going to say, okay, I got your novelty. Got it. I understand. I put it somewhere safe. I got yours, yours didn't conflict with theirs. You know, there's going to be a machine uh, that's going to coordinate 
um, coordinate the, the process, I'll call it, of creating and sharing novelty and growing this value. And these things have identity, right? The customer database, right? This, the product database. That is a thing that's, whose identity is, the pro is stable and whose value differs as time passes. Right? And if you're, how many people are closure programmers? Okay. So this should sound familiar, right? <laughs> um, this identity state value thing. It's the same stuff. I only really have one idea, so I just keep <laughs> over and over again. And then, so what I want to do is start being able to talk about, so that's the database system, and, and to a certain extent, um, that means what it always used to mean. And then we have this database value, which is a very new thing. You can't go to Oracle and say, give me the value of the database. And it says, okay. <laughs> and it just, it doesn't, um, we don't have this yet until you have systems like Datama. Um, and the values are the things that we want to use for computation. We don't want to do, we don't want to do computation via communication with this moving target. Right, that's what we end up doing with databases right now. It's very difficult to understand what's going to happen or what happened. Um, so we can contrast these two things. Right? This is the database as a process. So this is a traditional database. It works like this. There's some process. There's this novelty acquisition job, which we know is definitely a proper part of this process. Right? People have new stuff. They talk to the database. They say, put this in the database. And the database says, OK, I got it. Then. There's this left-hand side, and that's where it's ugly, right? We have some computation we want to do. We have some function we want to run on the database. We want to get a result. You know, that function is a function of what? When you issue a query to the database, it's a function of what? Knowledge. Maybe what's in the database at the time it gets run, depending on the read concurrency semantics that are set, and whether or not it's in a batch. I don't know. I mean, and most people don't. And they get it wrong, at least sometimes. Uh, so you have these questions, right? What is allowed? What are you allowed to do? Well, often, you know, the database process completely delimits what you're allowed to do. Here's the query language. This is what you're allowed to ask. You can't have other stuff. Um, and even as databases started to say, ooh, now you can run store procedures, write store procedures in Java or C Sharp or whatever, how many people are allowed to do that at their company? None. Right, it's the, are, you, are you really allowed? If I wanted to. Wow. <laughs> well, usually you're not allowed. <laughs> uh, so, so it's a fixed set of functions right, that you can run. Um, can you get reproducible results? Right? I want to run a test. I ran this thing. And now I'm like, ooh, that, doesn't look, that looks kind of squirrely. And then I run it again, and what happens? It's better. It got better. How many people have ever had a meeting where they said, we were having that problem earlier in the day, and then it got better. <laughs> yeah. It's just that it got worse. They often get worse. But I mean, the getting better part, when it gets better, yeah, I mean, does that make you feel OK? It's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's awesome. It got better. <laughs> it will never happen again. <laughs> and the other problem with this, you know, of course, we don't really consider it an inversion because it's all we've ever had, but it's really it's upside down. Right. And one of the problems with this is that how do you have a function of more than one database? Like how many people have ever set up like linked databases? Like, wow, that's, it just doesn't work. So you can't really have a function of more than one database because you send functions inside a database and they run in this context. It's the opposite of arguments. It's actually the opposite of functions, right? You're not sending arguments to a function. You're sending a function to run inside this space. <laughs> so. What do we do with the functional process? Well, like I said, this is important, right? This is, there, there is a job for the machine, and it is to take novelty in and say, got it, I put it somewhere. You're good. Because this is, this is, uh, this is change, right? So the, there has to be something that does that. It has to be sort of machine-like and stateful. And then we're going to say, all we're going to be able to do, the only other thing we're going to be able to do with that process is ask it for values. That's it. We took all the rest of the stuff away. There's no, there's no computation. So where is the computation? Out. Out, please. Get it out of there. Right? Take it out of this process. Because that's our problem. Right? That's what's not functional about this old model. So what happens with computation? 
Well, it's, it's what we said before. There's going to be a function, and it takes a database value as an argument, and it produces some result. Okay. What if we wanted to have more than one database? Okay. Usually we can have more than one argument, so we have more than one argument. What if we wanted to uh, have a database as a result? That's okay too. Right? And we have the same kind of thing, the same kind of question, actually. I don't know why. All right, so what's allowed? What's allowed in this function? What can you do? Whatever you want, right? It's your function. You're writing in your own programming language, which is the arbitrary power, I would hope. Um, and uh, can you get reproducible results? Yeah. That's the same problem. Yeah, you can use more than one database and everything else. So, as we look further at this, you get more value propositions. One is that the database has a value is just data, right? And therefore, it's not an API, it's not an object with a special set of stuff. It's sort of a language independent idea data, um, right? A, a map or a list or a vector, it's not like no language owns those things. And every language can sort of reach them. Um, and being data, it means you can do arbitrary aggregation, arbitrary con composition, which is very difficult to do with objecty kind of things or APIs. You right? can't really compose APIs and get semantics that you understand. Uh, and the other value proposition you get are the value propositions of the persistent data structures, just like the ones you, when you use them in memory. How people know what I'm talking about when I say persistent data structure in memory? Okay, that's good enough. Everybody else can ask anything else. <laughs> uh, so those, those benefits are alias freedom, right? I don't care, I can, I can, if I have a value of a database, I can give it to you and I don't have to worry, oh, I'm, I hope they don't screw me over later because I gave them access to my database value. Right? How many people feel that way about strings? Actually, it depends on what language you're using. <laughs> How many people are still using languages that allow you to mutate strings? How about numbers? Like if you gave somebody 42, who would be worried? <laughs> <laughs> No, you're not you worried about this thing. You can change it in Fortran. You can change it in a buggy Fortran compiler. <laughs> <laughs> it's never part of the standard. <laughs> so generally, we're, we're, we don't worry about things like that. And that's a really good thing, um, because that, that allows you to build programs that um, share a lot, but don't worry a lot. Um, and the other value proposition you get uh, in persistent data structures is that Change isn't like copy the whole world to get a new world plus one thing, right? Change is incremental and it's made efficient. Um, so the cool thing about this is that you end up with this one structure associated with the database, but you can get a lot of functions. Right? Datomic supports data log queries natively, but there's no reason you can have other query languages because you have everything that I have. Right? Everything that I had to write data log for Datomic, you have, and you could write your own language that you, you know, that satisfies you, because it's reverted control. Query languages, you can have a lot of them. Um, you can get direct index, uh, access to the indexes, which is another big feature, right? Because that's really the leverage part. Right? If, if the database is giving you leverage and saying, here, have at, um, it should give you that leverage. How many people have wished they could directly access the indexes in a SQL database? Yeah. Um, without causing the part. <laughs> And then finally, you can also, you know, just looking at the same exact structure, do um, objecty or graph-like things, right, or document-like things by navigating through entities and relationships and things like that. You pick your pick your poison or take whichever um, view of the world you want that makes sense. So one of the cool things about having persistent data structures in the database architecture this way is you can do speculation. You can say, I have this value of the database. I wonder what it would be like if I added this data. I don't actually want to submit this data to the process yet because I don't know what's going to happen. Right? I want to try it and see what the resulting database value looks like, maybe issue some queries, and then say, that all looks good. Or maybe I'm just doing um, prediction and I don't ever need to store this. I'm just going to say, what if we sold three times as much stuff next week? Would, mm -hmm. would uh, would we have enough inventory or would our shipping supply lines work? You can go and get that answer. You don't have to like change the database that everybody's looking at in order to get that answer. Um, and when you want to do backtracking, you just sort of drop the value you've created and go back to a previous value. Um, That's actually the most important thing that a bank does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happens if interest rates go this way? Or yes. 
Yeah, so it's, it's, easy, it's, it's easy to do that. The Atomic has a construct called with, which takes a database value, and this, the data you would have sent to a transaction, the data you would have sent to the process if you were going to issue a transaction. And you can just send them both to this function with, and you get back the database you would have gotten <coughs> if you had issued that transaction. Uh, and and people, people do this a lot and, and do very sophisticated things. There was, we have one customer who's doing like this event propagation where events go to children, go to children, go to children, and the, what happens to the children, you have to calculate using a query that already includes what happens to the parents. And they just write this beautiful little recursive function with width that propagates the change, and every sub computation sees the new view of the database. Um, what do you have, I mean, how do you do speculation with place-oriented databases? Uh, you roll back, right? You issue a transaction, hope you don't screw anybody over, and you roll back. <laughs> until you, you block the entire universe. Until this, this admins come after you. <laughs> Kill you. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're creative is you can do time travel. And so I, I sort of contrasted them. Um, I'm not going to get enough time to sort of dig into it, but the, the two possible worlds for doing a functional immutable database are you could do snapshots, which I don't really think is practical, or you could do this accretion thing. And when you use the accretion model, it means that every value of the database contains all the old values of the database. Like any one value contains everything that happened in the past, which means that if you have a value in the database, you can query anything as if it was a point in time earlier. So if you have the tree ring you know, out here, you can say, well, just pretend it was here and give me the answer about this. Um, so you can say as of a point in time or since a point in time, you know, from here out to there. Um, you can also query across time, right? Because if I can take a database and say, let me see you as if it was last Tuesday. And I can write functions that take more than one database. And, and saying, let me see you as if it was last Tuesday doesn't change this. But I can say now, last Tuesday, pass now and last Tuesday to a query. And query across time. What in between these two things? Or what's the ratio between this and that? Um, it, it just sort of changes everything. Um, it changes testing. Right? How many people like testing databases? <laughs> right? That word mock you know, it keeps coming up. It's not, it's, it's not going in favor of the humans, the mocking and the system. Uh, it's going the other way. Right, because what do you do, right? When a database is a place and, and interacting with the database is a conversation, how do you pretend, right? Because testing is like you pretend. You pretend this happened and you see what that happened, right? And you, so how do you pretend, like, these connections, they're, they're pretty much for real, right? So you have to either create an entire other database and completely put it in a, in a state and do this other thing, or what do you do? You put it in a mock where what? Everything always works. Oh yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's good. Okay, right, this is the mock. It's just like happily doing, you know, pretending to do whatever you asked it to do. And like, how difficult is it to make reproducible tests then? Well, unless you're gonna start from absolute blank every time and build up to it in a precisely known point, it's very, very difficult to make reproducible tests. Um, whereas, if you have a value-oriented database, uh, you don't flow around connections, right? Most of your code is written in terms of the values. So especially if you can fabricate values, and as you s you'll see in a little bit, as soon as I push the Or you can go here, with those specific you can, known past values. You can go with the past value, but also because it's values and it's just data, how many people have programming language where they can make up data in a program? <laughs> That's awesome. That's what programming language is for. And if all you needed was data to test the query, you could do that. You don't even need a database. You could just make it up. Um, and that's sort of the, one of the value propositions of values itself, right? When you program with values, um, you can generate them easily in programs, which means you can write tests and things like that. Um, so, uh, I, I mentioned earlier about information models, so let me just uh, describe what I mean by that. Uh, I, of course, I love the dictionary. It helps me write talks. <laughs> and. Uh, and this is what I found for information, which is to convey knowledge via facts, right? And to give shape to the mind or, or help people make decisions. And I think this is why we have databases, right? 
I mean, of course, I just talked to somebody who has a database that says, you know, the real main purpose of it is to just keep everything forever in case they get audited, right? <laughs> <laughs> which, is an, which is another, you know, it's a valid reason. Well, because um, you need to know the facts of what happened before. Right. So but, they, but especially those kinds of databases are, in particular, fact-oriented. Right? They're not place-oriented. You get a new thing, you don't go like, oh, I'm going to erase what I already have. Because <laughs> that, that, what does that do to your audibility? It trashes you, right? Um, so so that, that sort of takes us to, like, what does fact mean? Which is, this is the key here. This is the key to everything. The key to moving away from databases as places to keep your, you know, stuff to something richer. Which is that a fact is something that happened. In fact, so. A fact is something that already happened, right? It, it literally means something done, right? And there's two things about that that are interesting. One is it can't change because you can't change the past, right? And the other is it has to include time, right? We build up the you know primitive notion of a fact. Sally, how many people are satisfied with that as a fact? <laughs> <laughs> Sally likes. Nobody's buying it. Sally likes pizza. Is it a fact? It's a Some nods, but you know it's a trick question. So you place your bets. No, I mean, does, has Sally always liked pizza forever? How about before Sally tried pizza? Will she always like pizza? No. If you know Sally likes pizza, you know a very particular thing. At this point in time, Sally likes pizza. Um, similarly, Sally has an email address. Forever and ever and ever? No. Um, especially no. I mean, we're not going to do this. So, so, so facts are things that happen. So when Sally gets a new email address, it's not like the universe came to Sally's email address place and substituted something different there. That's not what happened, right? It's a new fact happened at a new time, and everything about it is novel. So you have to incorporate time. And so we have our primitive thing. It's a lot like RDF, right? This primitive thing with entity attribute value plus time gives you what I would consider to be a fact. Um, and what Datomic treats as sort of the primitive data representation. So I talked about the database as an expanding value. Well, here's my tree ring. This is a terrible <laughs> slide. I don't think you can see them. But they're tree rings, <laughs> right? So the database is this expanding value. I already described this. You're sort of discovering what it is. It's just an accretion of facts. You never change the path which you don't in real life either, right? It also means that process requires new space. And this is where people freak out, right? This is where people freaked out when you said persistent data structures in memory. Same thing, they're like, oh my god, copy and write. The world is going to end, right? I'm going to run out of memory. Well, a little bit um, of changes. Yeah, there's not that much change in the world, right? <laughs> uh, there really isn't. I mean, take, well, take, your, take your business. That's you just, great until you're doing weather. You're doing well. <laughs> weather. Weather. But still, as a percentage, Right? It, it, it just can't keep going indefinitely. So, well, so this is a monotonically increasing model. Right? Yeah. Doesn't that lead into scalability issues at some point? No, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if, if, you, if you're applying this to business problems, right? If your business is doubling every year, hoo-ha. But like, for how long? I mean, it's just not going to keep and, happening. And, 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 and storage capacity is going to double. Storage is beating you. It's already beating you. It will continue to beat you. It's not beating you for the scientific problem, that's for sure. Terabytes of data are coming in every day. So there are logging categories of problems yeah. where I, I think that this this uh, you still need the persistence. This is, this is true. You have to buy more disks all the time. Well, but I mean that's, that's what this says. It says yeah. process requires new space. So yeah. I mean, can you afford it or not? I mean, it's an independent question. If you can't, you can't. Uh, but it's it doesn't rule out this approach. And most people, I think, are not um, uh, quite aware of how little novelty they have as a percentage of all the information they're maintaining. And in um, the end, people need audit trails for anything that's... You're already doing this. Yeah. Yeah. How many people use Git? I mean, source code's not that big, but <laughs> we, don't, we don't overwrite, you know, we don't just keep our files and our, our source code in, like, directories and like, <laughs> uh, have that, you know, updating it by just replacing. And thing. businesses want this. Right? How many people are mining logs? Yeah, what is a log? It's an accretive thing with no leverage. That's what it is. It's the same thing. Maybe you want to throw stuff away later and for different reasons, and we can talk about that. Um, but the, the fundamental thing is you're moving away from places. Whether you keep it all forever or not, you're still not going to the email address place of Sally and substituting something. So 
Is there a way to, to purge data that's aged beyond a certain date? Because you're no longer interested. So that would be forgetting. It's sort of like uh, worms eating holes in the, in the tree. Uh, but you still. Like, you say stock market data, for example. It, it's kind of like a. It's a sliding window, yeah. And, and yeah. So, I mean, some of, that, that. some of that is a good fit, and some of it is not. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying this is universally applicable, uh, and you'd have to assess your, your problem. Um, Datomic does have excision, which allows you to forget. And it's still fundamentally different to never change anything and to forget things mm -hmm. than it is to update things in place. Right. Yeah. Sort of the big, the big idea. So we're moving away from places. Right. Um, I talked a little bit about snapshots or whatever, but the, the bottom line is you can't create a new root. Right? If you're going to have persistent data structures in memory, what do you do every time you have a new change? They're, they're trees, right? And every time you have a change, you uh, copy the path from the root to the new leaf, and then the tree shares all the rest of the old tree except the path to the novelty, which means you're producing a new root every time something new happens. But what happens in memory when you do that? What happens to the old roots? They get garbage oh, card, right? right? They get garbage like magic. This is yeah. good. And and how do you hand off the the novelty? Well, it's sort of automatic. Your program has created these new roots, and it's sort of as long as it doesn't like drop it, it's sort of it's a handoff system. It's just handing off. Here's the new thing. Here's the new thing. Um, if you're going to have processes come and go, maybe all the processes are down, and then they all come back up, and there's a database in the middle. There's no handoff strategy. The database would have to maintain a root. And ends up you just cannot afford to maintain a root for every, for every piece of novelty. Um, so you can't do that. You can't do a root per transaction. You can't, uh, you can't do um, snapshots. So you make the latest value include all of the past as well. And so essentially you have this big tree and you just keep adding new things to the tree. Um, and that, that's important for the information model. Um, I don't know if I talk more about that later. We'll so that means it has to be implemented using, using mutation. No, no, no. Exposed mutation. No, 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 no. No, it just implements in this single tree as opposed to a series of trees with new roots. Um, so what ends up happening? Uh, no, so, so I, I don't talk about it on the slide, but I'll, because you asked, right? Yeah. So what ends up ha to do this to do this properly, um, you need to combine a memory persistent data structure and a Durable one, because you do need to produce a new root every piece of novelty, but not in durable land. Mm -hmm. Which means you're going to log everything because you need to make sure it's durable when somebody says, "Here's my new stuff," and the process says, "Okay, I got it." You want that to be true, <laughs> um, but that doesn't have to be leveraged. That can just be sort of an append thing. That logging. Then what what you do is the same technique that Bigtable and other things use. You you uh, accumulate a bunch of novelty and memory. And you, you provide the leverage there with the persistent sorted data structure in memory. And that one, you can rely on garbage collection to just you know, clean up the roots. And periodically, that will grow to a certain size, you know, say 64 megs worth, right? And then you'll um, amortize the cost of integrating that in the big durable tree. So you're not producing a new durable root every transaction. You're acquiring a whole bunch of novelty and then merging that in. And that's how it works. So any query is actually going to be a merge join between a certain amount of novelty that's in memory and the last time it, it was integrated <coughs> in storage. Right, but the, is the disk treated as a log? <coughs> the, the, there are two things on storage. Yeah. Uh, one is an index or set of indexes, which are big trees. Right. And the other is a log, which is another big tree. The log semantics are append, okay. and the index semantics are merge. I mean, it's sorted. The index is sort, sorted. It has the leverage part. Okay. The log is just, I, I got it. So this is riser and this, in effect. Well, I mean, who, I don't know yeah. who's first. There's a whole bunch of things that do but this. That's why I go back. Right. Okay. They, they, all, they all work this way. Because it's a bit, you know, you're forced into it. If you think about this long enough, you're forced into this answer. You, know, you're gonna, you need a persistent data structure. You have to amortize. Um, and so this is how you do the amortization. Um, OK. Um, and then we have process, right, which is submitting novelty. And the key there is that we don't want that, that, that to be all like touchy-feely API oriented. We want that to be reified. We want to say, this is the novelty, and this novelty is data, right? It has a representation as data, not as function calls. 
change blah to blah with blah. You know, it's just like, here's the data. So we represent the, the novelty as assertions and retractions of facts. And that's the minimal thing. You can build higher le level things um, in terms of those. Right? So you can, you can build functions that yield assertions and retractions. And that's how you build up a system that can have a higher, higher level semantics. Um, but it's important then that this representation is minimal. So when people are concerned about storage, one of the things they're concerned about is, if I have this big record and I keep changing Sally's email address, and I'm going to rewrite this record every time, well, that's already, it's like time out. That's like the people who presume that persistent data structures were going to be copied on write. People who are saying, well, every time I change the email address, I have to write a new row or document. That will kill me. It would kill you. Right? You need to make sure that your represent representation of novelty is just the novelty. Right? I'm not, I didn't change all of Sally. I knew a new fact about Sally's email address. That's it. And that's all that's in there, and that's all that's going to get written. Not rewriting a Sally entity or document or row. And because it's temporally qualified, we don't care if it um, can't conflict. Can't conflict. Right. Okay. The time Got thing. It. Got it. Well, Sally's like in the Star Trek episode. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the attraction is a certain that there's no longer a fact here. That's, that's correct. Right. At this point, yeah. Yep. We no longer know what Sally's email address is. When you can do that. You can either no longer know it or say this is the value from here forward. But if you skip back in time, you see the old one. Can you assert yeah. negative things that this is not Sally's email address? No. You can't do any of that kind okay. of stuff. So this is not a semantic okay. uh, web database. Okay. Which, and there are those. And, and so one yeah. of the reasons why I made this was because I had actually tried to use those kinds of databases yeah. for business yeah. use as a database. And it's a misfit. Yeah. There, there's nothing wrong with those things. They have a lot of power. And you can solve a bunch of interesting yeah. problems yeah. with them. They're not necessarily a good fit for the things businesses use databases for. We constantly run into into false facts where we do not know the true facts. Yeah, that's why I asked about that. We just, it, yeah, we, we we believe that somebody was born on April seventeenth, you know, eighteen fifty four, and then we find out that this is not true, but we don't know when he was born. So yes, we well, so you can just retract. You could just retract straight that. retract. But then okay. you would you, then you then the database would seem to not know that. Right. That's what I was asking. Right. Um, so it's like you know, uh, double entry accounting. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard, but that's the truth. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much. This is what traditional databases are like. I mean, the things that you know are that there's this big server and it does everything. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> and that's to communicate to it using strings. And, and that if you want a prayer of having good performance, you have to remember the answers you got earlier and stick the answers in the cache. So it's kind of like everything was before. This is how it was. This is how it was before. <laughs> this is the before. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is the after. This is the after. And, and then the bottom line, and I'm, again, I'm not going to really dig into this too much, but the, the thing that Datomic does is it just breaks this apart and turns everything upside down. Just do that, and you end up with a different database. <laughs> so, uh, so what we do is we, we, we limit the job of uh, we, what we call the transactor to just that process part of the job. It happens to be the case that currently we run indexing on the same box, but that's not important. It could run on a different box. But the job of transaction management is the job that is only that. It's just, you said there's this novelty, I said I got it. You said there's this novelty, I said I got it. In addition, the, the transactor will ensure a monotonic single ordering of the entire world because the atomic is oriented around consistency, so it's consistent rights. Um, yeah. So the, the index has to like sort of merge in the new information. I'll like show you indexing um, more pictures later. <laughs> if, if, like there's one thing that's the physical index and then one thing that's your. Yeah, like I have a picture that goes like this. <laughs> on the next slide. <laughs> well, let me finish with this one. Uh, so there's something that just does transaction coordination. There's something that just does index merging. Right. Storage we separate out. So it used to be you know that the storage was the prominence of the the master you know, uh, server, and inside it, literally inside it. And that's an architecture born of, well, those big machines used to be really expensive and you only had one, so obviously that machine is in charge of the storage. And, uh, but that doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, so now what we do is we just say, that's a logical thing, a storage <coughs> service. Datomic treats storage services like, like the old databases used to treat file systems. It sticks chunks of indexes in them. But what could be a storage service? Anything, including other databases. You know, a SQL database can be that. DynamoDB can be that. We can run on Infinispan in memory, Reoc, Couchbase, 
All these things can serve as storages uh, underneath the atomic. And we treat them all the same like key value stores where there's this key and this immutable value, a big chunk of the inside of an index. We don't use any of the other capabilities of the storages. Uh, but it means you can make independent decisions about storages. And should you adopt a storage that has um, scaling characteristics and elasticity characteristics you like, like either REAC or something like it on-premise or DynamoDB uh, on AWS, um, you'll get those benefits because you'll see there's a line from storage up to what we call the application server process, which is just your program, but they're generally the application server parts of your program, where you're going to be running a library that includes the query. So we've moved query out of the server and up into the, what we call peers, right, these applications. And how many of those can you have? As you want. So now you're seeing you're going to get horizontal scalability of <coughs> queries. Right? And as, if, if you pick a similarly scalable storage, that part is completely independent because this live index, right, the novelty that comes into the transactor is actually reflected to the peers. Remember, <coughs> this is just the novel stuff, it accumulates to a certain point and then gets spooled out, at which point you can drop it. Each peer has got a copy of the live index so far and the ability to reach storage. With those two things, it can answer queries. It can pull as much or as little as it needs to answer queries. Every peer doesn't get the entire database, doesn't need the entire database. Um, and, and what's coming out of here is immutable. Right? So novelty comes in there, you update a persistent data structure, that's what that live index is. It's a, it's a persistent data structure in memory. In here are indexes, which are persistent data structures on storage, durable. Um, and since this is immutable, can you cache it? Yeah. You can cache it. Like there's no stop. You can cache it. Where can you cache it? Everywhere. Anywhere you want. How many times can you cache it? How many times you have to worry about cache coherency? When the transactor falls down, that's when you worry no. about it. Your, your, your read availability is great. Your write availability appears to be ass. So how do we fix that? No, you don't fix that. That's a, okay. that, is a, that is a trade-off Datomic makes. It says you have okay. traditional scalability on the writes, and you have new school scalability on the reads. Uh, because, because right now, I think we have this world where we have this extreme. You get the big server that does everything. It's really difficult to scale in any direction. And you get n <coughs> inconsistent databases, which scale, but like, you never know what's going to happen. Right. <laughs> But you know, so, people, people run Windows, and I guess that's I'm used to the idea that they never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not dictating what to choose. I'm just saying yeah, there yeah. seems to be this giant gap in between these two things, and that's what Datomic targets. Um, because, because it is really consistent, it, it is acid, um, it has those properties. And it ends up that, you know, if you read the research, um, if you take everything out of that transactor, like it doesn't, it, it doesn't handle any query load or anything else, um, it's. Mm -hmm. A lot of businesses yeah. can now overrun. It's just, it's you just write as fast as your disk can yeah. slip off the yeah. data. And also, you don't really need to worry that you haven't gotten the latest data. At least you've got something consistent as of a certain time. Correct. That's right. You, yeah. That's right. You always, have, you always have a view that is, that is consistent, what I would call business rules consistent. Yeah. Right? You never see half of a transaction or half of anything or something that doesn't, doesn't make sense. If you need to wait until everything up until a certain time has been processed, you just wait. Yeah, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. There are these API calls called sync that give you multiple different flavors. Because um, the monotonic timeline has identity of the points in time, you can actually communicate those very cheaply. And so if you said, I created something over here, and out of band I communicated to you that I did that, I could say what the time point of that was, and you could say, I don't want to act upon that until I see mm -hmm. the view of the world that includes that point in time. Or you, there's another flavor of sync which will actually ping through the server, which is sort of like the zookeeper model of knowing that um, to, to order events happens before, right? You can force the happens before um, scenario by pinging through the server and waiting for it to come back. So, yeah, the latest, does that make any sense to say that? The latest is just. Uh, so the latest is always getting pushed, and, and right, so what I said before is you don't really program in terms of connections, but if you ask the connection for the right, value right, of the database, right. that is the latest value the latest that it value. knows about. Right. That's right. If you call sync, you'll know, you'll get the value of the database um, that is definitely uh, Most after, likely. right. 
The sync call, that's right. Are, are these times like wall clock times or are they internal time? There's an internal time, but we also associate with the time of the transactor uh, of receipt. Okay. Uh, but transactions are first class entities. You can assert facts about the transactions, like this was my real world idea at the time, or this is who did it, or what process did it, or any. You can make facts about transactions, because transactions are first class. You can touch them, you can get the data. We'll see that in a second, hopefully. Okay, let me move a little bit more quickly. So, actually, I'm almost out slides. So I can show you, show you the database in action. So this is interesting. We saw a memcache cluster on the picture before this. What was in it? When, no, no, no. In the old databases, what do you put in your memcache? Results. Answers. Answers to what? Where old questions. Old answers to old questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with those things? 42. Here you go. Who wants it? Is it good? How do you know? <laughs> like this well, is a, this is a nightmare, right? As, as, you, as you say, things don't change all that much, or caching wouldn't work. Well, it depends. But you on wouldn't know. It on the the yeah. Yeah. Still, yeah. whose problem is it? <laughs> it's your problem, right? Well, you, you have to listen to transactions that are happening in the database to update your cache. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very difficult. What's in here? <coughs> Immutable source. Yeah. Sources yeah. of answers to questions. Yeah. Same stuff that's in the database. Yeah. Uh, and that ends up being a lot more reusable. And then you can cache and cache and cache. So. So you want to see a picture that looked like this. <laughs> so this is, this is what's happening, right? Transactions are coming in. They immediately get logged to storage in an appendy way. And they get transmitted to all the live indexes that are connected. Right? At some point later, an index merging process is going to go and siphon everything out of that live index and merge it into storage and create a new, uh, a new value in storage. So obviously there will, be, there will be different values of these trees, but they'll be very infrequent, not a new route for every transaction. Right? But how do we find the value of the database? How do we find the customer database tree? So this is that identity problem, right? So closure people, right? What do we do with identities? What, what, what set of constructs do we have for identity? The reference types, right? Reference, atom, right? Those kinds of things. Well, it ends up you do need something like that. You need something that's always got the same name, you know, the customer database root that you can swap something into. So it ends up that you can build the, entire, the entirety of Datomic with five of those on disk and one in memory. That's the total number of variables that you need to build a system. This is a huge system. That's it. That's all the variables you need. What are the five? Uh, there's a, there's a, a su several in storage for the, the roots of the different indexes. Um, there's something that coordinates uh, who is the transactor for this database. Um, catalog. Um, I forget what the other one. And then in memory, it's just the root of that live index is inside an atom, a closure atom. So and everything and goes through the index to get to storage. You have to kind of go to the index first before you. You don't have to reread that. You don't have to reread that root because you're no, informed. No, no, you're informed when you, when you move to a new tree. Until until you're informed of that, you at, once you dereference that that cell to find out the root, that root is valid until you're told about the, the next one. So you do not need to keep dereferencing that cell. Right, but, but it, it does it, mean it kind of includes the index, the current state of the index in that. <coughs> and you would go through that to find. You're always going to have the identity of the root node, but this is the immutable root okay, node. Right. You don't need to go through the mutable identity thing over and over. Right. Uh, that would be a catastrophe if you need to do that. But it does mean that storage is, in addition to the bulk of the work that they do, which is storing immutable values, do need to have the semantics necessary to do the equivalent of a closure atom in storage, which means they need the moral equivalent of CAS, compare and swap, in storage. Right? So SQL databases have that. And it ends up that Dynamo has that. Uh, but it ends up databases like REOC do not have that. So for databases like REOC, we split the job up and we say, REOC, you can deal with all the immutable stuff because you're eventually consistent and that's all you can do correctly. Um, and then we supplement uh, React with something like Zookeeper, which can do distributed cats. Uh, 
And that's, we just put the five references in Zookeeper. And we put all the values in Rio and combine the two. But you do need both those capabilities from storage. When we want to issue a query, that's like perception, right? And it's again, it's the closure model. Perceiving things shouldn't interfere with process. It has nothing to do with process. So I issue a query. I need to access the novelty and access storage and merge them together and run my function on the, the merged result. Where's the coordination in this? None. Where's none? Where do we talk to the transactor in this? Don't do that. Can we make this horizontally scalable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Process and perception. You want to bring them tear them apart. OK. This is where it gets scary. <laughs> I have to use my computer in front of people. My secret problem is I don't know how to use computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always bad. All right. All right. The other thing that's always amusing for people is, in addition to being bad at computers, I'm really bad at being <laughs> but for this audience, it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> uh, everybody can see this okay? Uh, so, can we get a little bigger? Bigger. See, now you're testing my <laughs> ready. Man first. Let's do it first. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Ooh. Actually, if oh, you could, it did it only in one buffer. If, yeah. you could do, if you could deal with it one less, you'll see more, which might help you understand more. Is that all right or no? Yes. So vote. It's like a eye test. Is this better? You know, the optician. Is this better or is this better? Yes. Second. Second. All right. I'll move. I'll make this smaller. Okay. You've just seen the extent of my. No, I have one more thing I know how to do anyway. <laughs> then, then I'll have exhausted. I'm exhausted. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm just going to move my cursor around up here, and the only thing I know how to do is Control Option X, which executes where my cursor is. So we'll load up Datomic and then uh, some pretty print stuff. I don't know if I even use this. And I think my server is still running. If my machine didn't fall asleep. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, we load the Datomic API, which is really tiny. We get pprint. We're going to just make this helper function that creates a temp ID. I'm not going to have time to talk about these namespace things. But Datomic follows the namespace um, approach of, of closure in, in that namespaces are important. So we're going to use them. Um, so when we talk about a database, it has identity. We like these databases, when possible, to have global identity. So when you use something like Dynamo, that's something that you know anybody's database and anybody else's database have names that don't conflict. When you start using local resources, well then, it's a little bit on you. But the idea is that you use a URI to name the database. So there's a protocol, then where is it, and then that's the database name. And then we create a database saying create database and use the URI, and that should say I did it, or I didn't do it, which means it was already there. Otherwise, you get a failure. Now we're going to see this connection, right? which is we're creating a connection. This is the process part. You're going to see we use this very infrequently. That's the idea behind Datomic, that you don't use it very often. You're going to send transactions over this connection. Every now and then, you're going to ask the connection for the value of the database. But remember that diagram, right? That was the only two things connections that had to do. Take new stuff and give you the value of the database. Um, so that's what we do. So we make a connection <coughs> to the database. We do everything with Datomic with data. So for the Lispers that are not uh, closure people, but one thing Clojure does is radically controversial <laughs> <laughs> is it, it provides literals that have the same power as lists do for vectors and uh, sets and associative maps. Uh, and they're all immutable. And uh, it's, it's kind of a big deal. It's, I don't mean, know <laughs> against that argument in this room, but then. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, so schema is represented as data, and I'm not going to again get into this, but you can sort of get the gist of it. In, in Datomic, the only schema we have are the definitions of attributes. We said entity attribute value. There's no notion of classes <coughs> or record types or anything bigger than attribute. But an attribute does have a definition that says whether or not it's unique, 
what kind of, uh, what type of values can it take on, what the cardinality relationships are, uh, and things like that, and then where, where, where it lives and what its name is. So this just sets up a single attribute called email that we're going to use for this demo. And by saying def schema, I just now have that value in that variable, but I haven't done anything with it yet. Um, so I didn't, I didn't change the database. But now I'm going to change the database for the first time. I'm going to issue a transaction through the connection, and I'm going to pass the schema. You can pass more than one thing, so we always pass a collection of um, things to transactions. That's why it's in, in, a, in a vector. So it's a vector that has one thing in it. And effectively, this, this map is just sugar for saying the same entity has a DBID of this and an identity of that and the value type of this. These are all triples, right? What are they missing? The time part, right? But the time part's gonna be established by the, the transactor when it arrives. So you just have entity attribute value. So by using a map, you're just saying for the same entity, it's presumed, the E part. And this is all just now attribute value, attribute value, attribute value, because it's the same E. If yeah. I want to collect like historical data that definitely happened in the past, like before yes. I saw my database, can I provide my own times? Yes, you can once and once through as long as you don't lie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't go to the future and you can't do stuff out of order, but you can see the database with historical times. You can assert what the transaction times were for uh, seed data. Uh, so once yeah. you once you once you give something without a historical time, then you have to always, you can never give it a historical time. No, you can, as long as you time. never yeah. conflict with, with anything that's yes, in there, you can't create out of order time. Mm -hmm. You can do everything else. But that's only transaction time. It's not internal time of a, of, of, of a temporal event. Yeah. You know, you can, you can assert somebody's birthday, you know, was in 1960 and then somebody else's birthday was in 1958. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's different. This, this, and yeah. it's very important <laughs> to note that the that, that datomics notion of time is the time of the database value itself, not about the events in the world. Right. It's, right. it's about going around in time in the value of the database itself, because that's the only time I can manage. You could tell me any arbitrary stuff. I can't be in charge of whether or not that's correct. It's, it's and about when you knew about it. No. Well, when you it, it's when the database, when the database knew about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So the time essentially is the radius of your tree. The time, yeah, sort of right. That's right. It's, it's actually the rings themselves. Each one is like, you can imagine each one being a transaction. Are there restrictions on the values you can put in? Um, like what types, <laughs> do, what actual yeah. types do you have? Yeah. Um, there's a set that's supported. Um, we do have the technology under the hood to allow that to be extensible. Um, we haven't exposed that yet, but it's certainly possible. So the, this is just something I missed. Uh, you mentioned that the, we have a map there. Um, obviously, yes. those are the attribute value. Uh, the yes. entity is the entity. What's the entity? The entity is uh, because we're we're uh, asserting that its ID is a temporary ID. The database yeah. is going to say this is a new entity. This is all about an entity that I don't know about yet, and therefore I'm going to supply a new entity ID for it. Uh -huh. So you're creating an anonymous entity. Correct. And it will know. And that entity, that anonymous entity, tells you how to interpret the email attribute later. Yes, yeah, so basically just all these facts are going to be associated with the same entity ID. Entity IDs are not actually semantic. They're supplied by the database, they're just numbers. Mm -hmm. The semantics come from what you said about it, which is how it should be, I think. Right. So if you have multiple schemas, you're only using one in this example. And so yes. Can you refer across each other for things like foreign key constraints? There's no, there's no constraint. So that's definitely an area where this is challenged when compared to a row-oriented database because row-oriented databases know that there's a relationship between attributes that applies to a thing and it will always have all the attributes. Um, you would have to do anything like that yourself. Uh, I'm not going to get to talk about transaction functions much, but that's a tool you can use to do your own enforcement of arbitrary constraints. And when you do that, you can enforce constraints that cross things that you can't do a foreign key. You can really issue, you can do arbitrary constraints because is this fact consistent with all known facts? Anything you want for, to say for application because essentially a constraint yeah. is a function of the value of the database. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything you want. Yeah. Anything you want. Right. This this is maybe way out there, but uh, you know 
in addition to B-tree indexes, you know, now, you know, Postgres, for example, you've got uh, full text indexes, gen and disk, yes. uh, you know, geolocation data. Um, does, does Datomic allow for, you know, a wide variety of different kinds of indexes? We don't have pluggable indexes. We do have full text. And we've had a fair number of requests for the geo, so we'll probably do something there. Okay, let me, uh, let's, let's put something in there. <laughs> uh, so we have the schema, it's this value, we're putting it in a vector because we're going to send a set of values and it's just this one guy. Um, and then we're going to say transact to the connection. So this data gets sent over the wire, and this, this is, I'm actually running over the wire. You can run the atomic memory, but this, I'm running the transactor server as another process over here. Um, so we issue this thing, and we get back a return value from issuing a transaction. So what's in that? It ends up that that's a map. I'm just going to look at the keys of that map. Right, so I got back a map from this call. The keys are really interesting. I issued a transaction. I got back the database before the transaction, the value of the database before the transaction. The value of the database after the transaction, immediately after the transaction, and immediately before. How many people have ever wished they could go back to the database and see what it was like just before the transaction? Or just say, ah, it's gone. Right. Always, always, always get these two values. The data that was produced by the transaction, right? Because there are these transaction functions that might expand into assertions and retractions. They might actually query the database and find out new stuff. So what actually got asserted by this transaction? When you look at a SQL transaction, how do you know what's going to happen? Or what happened? No <laughs> idea. You just don't you even know. The number back. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. Um, you know, it's, sometimes it's just a matter of saying, you know what, maybe it, even though it's always like this, maybe it shouldn't be like this. You know, it's always been like this, maybe it shouldn't be. And then we get any temporary ID. So this is actually a map. The temp IDs is a map from uh, the temp ID you generated, which if you had held onto in your program, would be some arbitrary thing, yeah. and the actual entity ID that got created in the database. So you can then go and say, oh, this temporary ID became this concrete ID, and I can use that to sew together new stuff. So all these things you always wish you had, you get all the time, uh, every, every query. So now we're going to capture the value of the database after this transaction. We're going to call it new DB, and just so we can talk about things later. So one of the things we want to do is say, is the new DB the same as the database before the, 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 before the transaction? And we're going to use equals to do that. What is the database value actually? I don't have that picture in the slide. <laughs> it's, it's big trees. It's you're getting the keys yeah. out of this map. Like, what is the, the, the database? The value is, um, is it just it's, a root? It's, just it's just like a little data structure that has roots. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Just the identities of roots, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So we can use equals to determine if the two databases are the same. And uh, then we can see is that we're going to go say, is the new database the same as asking for the database from the connection? So DB of connection is like the latest. Right? So how do you get the latest? You just ask the connection for the latest value of the DB. That actually doesn't go over the wire because everything's getting pushed to you. <coughs> Over the connection, when you ask this question, you immediately get an answer. It's w whatever most recent value we were told. So when you ask for the database value, you actually have it locally? When you have what? When you ask for the database value, you already you have actually it. have it locally. Yeah, you already okay, have That's it. why you don't need to catch it. Well, you... Um, or another point of view. You, I, don't go, I don't go across the connection. I don't go over the wire to okay. answer this thing. Okay. The connection idea is still there, right. and it's still behaving the same way. Yeah. Uh, but if there's push going on, so why, why pull when you can right. push? Yeah. Um, so now we can say, is this the same? Now, if there were other people around messing with my machine, which hopefully no one's doing right now, <laughs> um, what this answer, we don't know what this answer is, right? So it says, is the database right after I issued the schema transaction the same as the database? Like, I'm going to go ask for the database value right now. This is not necessarily going to be true, but if no one else is messing with my machine, it is going to be true. And for the purposes of this, um, demo that will continue to be the case. <laughs> so this is like asking, has anything changed? Has anything else changed? Yeah, has anything else changed? That's right. Uh, so queries, also data. Um, there's a bunch of things. This is slightly a sugared version of it, which uh, is easier for people who don't know Clojure and, and don't like writing nested data structures to write. Uh, but there's a map version that's 
only slightly more robust. That's more regular. Um, and so query is just data. In this case, we say find some that variable e and email where e's email address is email. Basically, this is a way of saying, get me all the emails. All the entities and their email. So we're not doing this right now. We're just taking a piece of data and calling it query. In order to issue a query, uh, we have to call Q, which is the function that does a query. And we pass it to query and the database to query. What is missing from this call? Connection. <laughs> we're, we're there. And there's no emails in this database. We made that we defined that email is an attribute, but we didn't say anybody had email addresses yet. We just said that email address is a thing you could have. Yeah. All right. So let's make somebody with an email address. Yeah, how does it know that colon email means what you said it meant and not what somebody else said it meant somewhere else? That's what namespaces are for. This example okay. does not have namespaces in it. It's very bad of me to have done that. <laughs> uh, but, but apparently the namespaces freak out people. They're like, oh my god, there's a thing and then a slash. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but any, any real use of Datomic, all of those names would be namespace. And that gives you a nice conflict-free way to have different things. But the, what's cool is that um, it's not like you have to have walled gardens. If there are attributes that truly are semantically shared between things, you can share them. They're not inside rows or inside record definitions. They really can be shared. So it depends on what your, what your needs are. So let's put an actual user in. So we're going to say the same kind of thing. Uh, we're going to say transact across the connection. We're going to supply a list of, of transaction values. We're going to use that map technique to create an anonymous new guy whose email address is fred at email.com. And we're going to issue this transaction. We get a return value again. Same thing is in there. Before, after, what the stuff is, whatever. So let's look at those temp IDs. And we see the temp ID negative 922 blah, blah, blah became 1759 blah, blah, blah. There are ways actually to call functions and get like what the T time of this thing was and stuff like that. Um, I know that's not a very pretty number. Are temp IDs always negative, or is that an accident? They're always negative. Uh, oops. Uh, now I'm going to make a helper. I'm going to grab uh, Fred's ID. So we take that return value and uh, the temp IDs out of it, and the first one of those, and grab its value. So this is just piping. This just takes all your parentheses and makes them go away. <laughs> but it does what you think. It just does it in the opposite order, which is the way everybody else thinks. So there you go. We just, well, however you want to think, we'll just make it, make it happen. Uh, but it's, un, it's undeniably more concise and has less. So, so another thing, thing. This, this also gives you, is like, like any other triple store or whatever, you can add your own attributes to someone else's object. Yes, you can. Yourself. Yep. 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 So, uh, so that's a useful function. We're just going to name it. We'll it's call it. I don't like your face, which is adding my attribute to your object. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and Rich has a hard stop time, so do we yeah. want to just steam through the demo? Yeah, let me let me let me go a little bit faster. But um, you know, I'm happy to have it be any combination. But we will have we will have to stop soon. Uh, so let me try to get through this. So remember new DB. When, when did we grab new DB? Right after we issued the schema. So if we Send the query to new DB, having added Fred, what will we see? Nothing. Uh, not, hopefully <laughs> nothing, right? <'Cause laughs> if that messed with new DB, we don't have values. Nothing can change new DB. Nothing can change the answer of this query on new DB mm -hmm. ever, 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 ever. That's the beautiful thing. So if you have a whole bunch of queries you need to do to do analyses, you can have the same basis. You can keep using the same value over and over. You're going to get the same answers, and you're going to have stuff that correlates. How many people ever tried to issue a report that involved multiple queries and then the numbers didn't add up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what can you do? You just actually have no tools to, to make it work. Uh, so if we want to now capture the value of the database after we did FRED, we're going to do that. We're going to call it the FREDDB. Now if we issue the query against FREDDB, what are we going to see? FRED. FRED's email. Right? We want the entity ID and the email. That's what we asked for. 
So we'll do another transaction, just adding Ethel exactly the same way we did Fred. Get the same kind of return value. Right, the database after, we're going to call the Ethel DB. This is the value database after doing Ethel. So we now have new, which is after the schema. Fred, which is after Fred. Ethel, which is after Ethel. Right, and the same thing. Fred DB doesn't change. Ethel DB has what? Fred and Ethel. Right, and if we go back to over the connection, say latest. What about the latest? Did anybody get on my machine? No. Still secure. <laughs> Apparently NSA is not interested in this. <laughs> uh, so now let's look at speculation. I talked about speculation, so let's look at speculation. So you're a newcomer to Atomic. This is all very, very strange. Everything's upside down. Somebody asked you to go and change Freddy, Fred's name to Freddy. Um, maybe you're not sure how to do that. <laughs> so you heard about the speculation thing and this function called with. So instead of issuing a transaction, you want to try with. You're going to say, I don't really know what I'm doing yet. Let me try to make this update to Fred's email to, to turn, change it to Freddy. So what we want to do is create a Freddy transaction that sets email to Freddy at email.com. So we make this transaction. Now instead of sending it, we're going to send it to the connection, but instead of using transact, and actually we're not sending it to the connection. We're going to get the value of the database, the current value of the database, out of the connection. We're going to take that value of the database and send it to width. Right, so instead of sending a transaction to a connection, we're going to send the database and this transaction to with, which just gives us a new database in memory. Doesn't, doesn't go across the wire. And we're going to get the after value of that, and we're going to call that the Freddy DB. Now what's in the Freddy DB? Uh, three units. Three, three things. things. Yeah. Yeah. We did not do this correctly. What happened to us? Generated a new ID. Yeah, we asked for a new entity. We didn't. We didn't actually change Fred. We just made up a new new guy called Fred. But did we mess anything up? Nope. No. We didn't send this. We didn't issue this transaction yet. So let's fix it. Remember, before we grabbed Fred's ID out of the um, temp ID thing, yeah. told us what Fred's ID was after he would been created. <laughs> we can't know that in advance, but we can save it after the the query. This is what we want to do, right? Say Fred's email is now this. And that will we'll say that's the Freddy transaction. And now we're going to try this in memory again, get the latest value of the database, pass it to with with this transaction. That's going to return the same stuff a real transaction with, and we'll get the after value out of that. We call it Freddy DB. And now we issue the query, and what do we get? Freddy and Ethel. So we're good. Now that we're good, let's actually do it. This is nice. This is like, I, 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 don't, I'm, I don't get fired, David. <laughs> we, didn't, we don't change anything. This Freddy transaction was data. We just tried it with width. We can send that same exact data precisely to transact. And this is how we do it for real now. And so now this Freddy DB is the value returned by transact. And it did really happen. If we go back to across the connection and ask for the latest value of the database, we did, we did change something that everybody will see. All right, let's quickly look at history. If we grab the latest value of the database, we're going to call it the latest value of the database. And we can issue the query on that, and we see this. But what I told you was um, databases are accretive. Databases are accretive, which means that they have all of the history before them. So uh, we can actually issue a query that crosses history. This basically lifts the, the fact that normally query is going to show you the most recent value of every attribute present in a bit database size. So when I asked for Fred's email address, it said Freddy, because that's the value that was there. But Fred is still in there somewhere. So I can issue a quirk, I can say, take a database value and ask it for its history, which will now make every uh, attribute that it ever had available to query. And so if I issue a query against this, what am I going to get? Fred and Freddy. And F. That's beautiful. Yeah, see, Fred, Freddy is uh, 418, and then 418 again here. But it doesn't include any time. It just gives you all the values. Oh, that would be good if you could get the time. <laughs> He's not a plan. Back to the drawing board. He's not a plan. <laughs> so, what if we what if we change? Well, we're going to make a new query now. We've been reusing the same query over and over. It's the same 
thing for it. We're going to make a new query. We're going to say find e email. So this pattern matching that occurs here basically binds to the datum, right? Entity attribute value and time. If you leave something out, you just didn't bind it. But if you put something there, you can bind it. So we can capture the transaction values associated with these datums by just putting another variable in this binding form. So it's exactly like it was before we added this TX. We'll call this T query. So now if we issue T query against the database, <coughs> we should get the TXs for those. There we go. There's a TX there. But what happened? How many things do I have now? One of them. Four. This is effectively across all values of the database. Why do I have more now? I just asked to get the TX, and now I have more. But why would I see? How do I see it? I see Fred twice. Fred yeah, at 313 and Fred at 317. Yeah, there's a 10 by D when Fred's actually They're different. Retraction. I better have retracted the other one, or I'm going to have two all the time. Fred will have two. Well, it ends up that this triple and quad thing is all a lie. They're quints. <laughs> there's an entity, there's an attribute, there's a value, there's a transaction, and then there's whether or not it was an assertion or a retraction. <laughs> That's really what's in the data. It's like HR has got new else. So we now have full query, which gets all of those pieces. And if we issue full query across the history, we'll see that this 313 is when we s asserted that Fred's email address was Fred, and 317 is when we retracted that Fred's email was Fred. Mm -hmm. So you, you keep track of all the transactions? That's what it's saying. We keep track of everything. Everything. Yeah. That's good. But yeah. just the novelty, just the, just the, just the change. Right, right. Just the change. So this right, is all right, small. Right. If Fred had a, a hundred other attributes, right, right, this right. would still be this small. It's just like social stuff. Yeah, which we all understand. It's like that Git thing. Yeah. <laughs> if I really want to leave something permanently out of We have something called excise for forgetting. And uh, that, is, that is permanent. Although it has this interesting attribute, which is that um, while you can forget something, you cannot forget that you forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, will not, we will not let you do that without, without a record that that happened. So you won't know what you knew, but you, you will know that you did know something and you chose not to know it anymore. So that it's auditable. Um, so so we, call it guilt. we call it excise. So <laughs> a change is really two transactions, right? It's an assertion or retraction. A change, that's right. If it, if it, if it is a, if it is a, um, if it wasn't there before. It is a, a um, cardinality one, right? If it's cardinality many, many, then you could have like two favorite foods. Oh, Right. And so right. favorite food could have more than one value at a time. Right. Yeah. Can you chase those excisions up a uh, hierarchy? Like, can you forget that you forgot that you forgot it? But then you keep no, you cannot forget forgetting. <laughs> 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 Even though that's a fact, you can't excise it? No, you can't. You can't Why not? Can't you you because I won't let you. <laughs> <laughs> because, because otherwise, the first promise isn't meaningful. Um, because, because you really don't know a lot about what you excise. You know sort of the category, depending on how you excise. So if you could say you could so excise, excise. excise. Is it the value of its excise? I mean, well, what is no, 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 what it's, is, it's, it's what gone. Is it's gone. We have, it, it's, yeah, it's, what is kept, I should say? Nothing is kept. A new fact is added that you did it. And, and what does that fact know? Yeah, what is it, it depends on how you expressed it. it. It remembers how you expressed the excision. Okay. So you could say excise before this period of time this attribute, and you would know that that happened, but not the values. Well, obviously, if you kept the values, you wouldn't have forgotten. <laughs> so, there, so really, the, the quits are all lie too. There's also there's also a sixth thing that says no, 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 no. Excision, it's actually gone. It's off of storage. No, but the the records of excisions are themselves on. Well, no, they're they're no, they're their own they're their own facts. I just don't let you excise them. Right. Oh, okay. But they're they're so you have to know which ones are excisions. Yeah, but they have attributes that say they are. So that's, sure. that's why he's saying it's an all right. internal. No, 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 it's not an internal. It's ordinary data, but it, you just oh, can't so I, change. I can introduce fake, uh, uh, fake um, excisions into the database then. Um, you might be able to. I'm going to stop that tomorrow. <laughs> 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 it's, your, it's your own problem.
you're saying that I yeah, screw I mean, around with yeah, the yeah, yeah, you want like your auditor comes to you and says, no, no, it, it is it is a lot like closure and being, you know, like a consenting adult. Yeah, it is. But but I, I do want <laughs> I do want <laughs> excision to be not all not all not not all RDA just are on your side. No, no, no. This isn't highly encouraged, right? All right. So um, we saw that. Uh, the last thing I want to show, yeah, a couple, a couple more things. Let me just get through this because I am running out of time. Uh, is um, this notion of a basis. So you can, given any database, get a readable, relatively readable um, uh, value for what the monotonic incrementing number is for that. So we saw transaction IDs before. They're big entity IDs because transactions are entities also. But there is this monotonic time, which is encoded inside that number. And you can grab that out just basis T. So, um, and you can also go back and forth between these two things. So given a monotonic time, you can get the transaction ID. Given a transaction ID, you can get the monotonic time. They're, they're mechanical transformations. So what's neat is that if you can capture a basis thing, you can now use that with these two other functions, which allow you to see the database as of a certain point in time. And you could, you could also put calendar time in there if you wanted. Um, but, but you can use these monotonic things to be extremely precise and, and, and get as of and since. So we're going to take the latest DB. Remember, that's after we did everything. And we can say, let me see that database as of um, the point in time that we did the FRED transaction. And what should we see now? Remember, we're passing the latest database. But we're saying as of this point in time after FRED. What are we going to see? Just Fred. This is from right after Fred. The space is from, from the Fred DB. And we can also see since. What should we see in this? Freddy and Ethel. We're not, we're not doing the history query. We're using the, the first query. So we're just going to see currentness. So we can see what happens since. So you can do the slice and dice. See, see a window of time in the past. See a slice. You can combine these two things and get a particular slice. And and history represents all the asserts and retracts, whereas the... the history is all the assertions and retractions as of just says, don't look beyond this point in time. Right. Just restrict yourself to this ring of the tree. But it's the same, it's the same, the most recent as of that point in time is what you'll see in the query, which is what people ordinarily want to see. Uh, history query is pretty specific. Yeah, uh, so but one thing that... Is you seeing anything that's been asserted but not retracted. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> the most recent assertions. Is another way to that are different from what that as of. Yeah. That, that yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I talked about querying two DBs. So let's write a query that takes two databases. We add a new clause here, which is in. Um, in the absence of the in clause, there's a presumption that Q is going to take one argument, which would be the database. So instead of having an ambient database, we have a default argument. Uh, but when you want to have more than one database, you just start naming them. You say in these two databases, I'm going to call dollar sign D1 and dollar sign D2. And then, oh, another lie. There's something else on the left-hand side of the pattern match, which I left out, <laughs> which you don't normally need to use. But when you're specifying databases, it's actually the most precise way to talk about a data is in this database, this entity, this attribute, this value, this transaction, this assertion or retraction. That's what's completely available to you. It's just the leftmost argument is, um, not provided when you don't have more than one thing to dis distinguish because it would just be ugly. But when you need to distinguish, you need to distinguish, so that's how you do it. So we're going to say, um, get me the emails from database one and get me the e emails from database two, and we're going to find, uh, we're using the same, uh, the same variable here, which is effectively the way you do joins. Right? It's like logic variables, right? You use the same variable and it needs to, it needs to bind in both clauses for both sets. And that's how you do a join. There's no join logic or anything else. You rename the variable. So this is effectively a query that says, who has the same email address in these two databases? Right? But what are the databases? Well, they're arguments, right? This is just a query form that gets databases passed as arguments. So what databases do we want to pass? Well, let's pass these two. Let's, let's issue this new query to saying, who had the same email address in the Ethel database and in the very latest database. Ethel. Only Ethel. Fred's email address changed between the two. So Fred doesn't have the same email address. Um, 
I don't know. In most databases, this is a much more tricky part. <laughs> um, and the other thing I said before is that uh, data is as good as a database. So I've been issuing queries against databases, but when you want to do testing or you want to ask questions of your stuff in memory, remember one of the premises on my first slide was bringing declarative programming to programs. Well, if that's really true, and it was only limited to datomic databases, well, that, that wouldn't be a good lie, right? These other lies have been good. It's like, oh, look, there's more. But that would be a bad lie. It's like, oh, no, that's not good. It's limited to that. And it ends up it's not, right? This query engine, it runs against ordinary data structures. It doesn't actually, I mean, it has some optimizations when it encounters these database values. But the logic of that pattern matching query, that applies to any kind of rectangular collection. So let's pass two collections to query two. This is the query that said, who had the same email address in these two databases? We see, but now instead of passing two, this is the same query, query two. This is the same function, Q. This is not databases from the <laughs> database. This is a vector of a vector with a tuple of symbols and keywords and strings and another vector. This is not mocking anymore. This is programming with values. Because I told you, right, if you have a program, if you have programming language that, that lets you make values, you can use it. And so you do. So we're going to issue the query against this, and what's it going to say? Lucy. All right, well, that's all I had time to show tonight. Uh, any quick questions? I can take five more minutes of questions. Is there somewhere we can play with this? Yes, go to datomic.com. In fact, we just uh, last week announced that uh, a starter version that lets you use all of the storages. So two peers in all of the storages. So you can try it out against Dynamo or SQL or anything you want. And that's uh, it's free and um, is a, is a, a perpetual license. So. You can really try it. You can build production, small production systems that way, um, no charge. So, what's please not try free? it. What's not free? Um, a version that allows you to have an arbitrary number of peers. So that version will let you have two peers, so two application servers. We, we you know, the ones we sell will let you have more. Um, the other things it's missing is it does not have the ability to use memcache, which is a transparent aspect of Datomic. You basically say, "Here's my memcache," and we'll put. We'll use it as an internal cache. It does not have that. Um, it does not have. Uh, it does not have high availability. That's the, that's the other thing. It have. So the the full version of Datomic, you can start up two transactors, and one will wait for the other one to have a problem and immediately take over. And it does not have that. So that's it. Otherwise, it has everything else including you know, the query language, all the storage backends. You can run, there's a memory database that you can run, so we were running testing, and then you can have to use the storage. You can do all the stuff in memory um, with a, a version that keeps the database in memory. So this is not a question, but a comment. This is very similar to what we're doing at Bank of America, um, with you know, Michael Martin and Kim from Goldman. Uh -huh. This is almost what we're exactly what we're trying to do with our financial data. I think everybody's going to end up here. Yeah. I mean, it's just there's so much business pressure to not forget things, yeah. to have auditability, to understand time. People want to do more analysis. But, yeah, they need to, to know. To fix your, your knowledge at some point in time, what was your view? Yeah, and just to see things over time. You know, for instance, if you have a, let's say, it's a very typical thing. Let's say you have a, your, you make products and you have suppliers of parts for the product. And you keep that in a database with the, like, the part and the price. In a place-oriented database, every time your supplier changes the price, you nuke the price before. And then somebody comes up to you, a business person comes up and says, does it seem like you know, this supplier always changes their prices in June? Should we be buying May in May from them? To like, and you're like, I wish I could help you there. But all I know is <laughs> to make this price. To find out your historical profit, you can't anything, it. Anything, this is just important. This is how we think. How many people could make good decisions if you didn't remember before yesterday? <laughs> you couldn't. You couldn't. And that's what we're asking businesses to do. But we don't do that. We use Git, right? We log everything in our programs. We're like, are you crazy, man? I don't want to have to debug this program without a log of, of like every possible thing it did. I don't want to be in that position. My, my business owner, though, you know, he, doesn't, he, doesn't need that, he doesn't need that kind of power. So when you have, um, 
with the persistent ma maps and vectors, you can have like a vector million slightly similar vectors. And that's something that comes up when you're trying to model bitemporality, which is a concept of time changing in time or time uh -huh. series in time series. Uh, so like let's say you have like a million vectors that are all slightly similar or slightly different, and there's a lot of shared structure that so you can fit that thing in memory and closure very easily because mm -hmm. the persistent. If you, if you built it against atomic in the same way you would build it in memory, which is the sharing was visible to you as you built it, you can get the same kind of sharing. If you think that sharing is going to magically occur, it will only magically occur if you use identities consistently. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. For, for writing now, you can pretty much just do, um, get it as of your physical knowledge time on the database and then cut off whatever is your yeah. business date. I, well, I'm going I'm to take one more question, but I want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs>